Yes, here we go. Nice. Technology is very interesting. Can be every now and then. Well, it's yes. beautiful at Here the same time. <laughs> so beautiful. So welcome to Medical Mondays with Dr. O. We're back again for another beautiful session. And I hope you all had a beautiful Labor Day. Um, I did. I had an amazing time at my niece's wedding. And um, so I thought it was nice that we took off to celebrate um, Labor Day. So um, Dr. Toyin Okwesomi, a family practitioner, HIV specialist, and I treat addictions in Maryland. Um, I enjoy sessions that we do here, medical missions, and just disseminating uh, correct, pungent medical information. Tonight, we're going to be talking again about what we think is women's health, right? But really, it's all of our health. Without conversations like this that we're gonna to have tonight, um, there will be no procreation for some, maybe for most, because we're seeing a lot of problems that we, than we've ever seen in our generations. So we are grateful to be blessed by Dr. Oluyemusi Famuiwa, who is one of our best in the state of Maryland in infertility medicine. And what a gem. I'm going to hand over to her to talk to us about, hmm, you want to get pregnant? What about the egg quality? What about it? The floor is yours, Dr. Famuiwa. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoy coming to this forum. Um, and I love the back and forth is really wonderful. Um, I'm going to try and share my slide. Okay, share. Can you see my slide? Is this visible? Dr. Yes. Okay. Yes, it yes. is. Yes, okay. it is. All right. So We'll get started and today the topic about quality of egg or sperm is really a lot. So what we're doing is just breaking it down a little bit tonight and um, we go back and forth between talking about the egg quality as well as the sperm quality um, and we'll talk about more about the sperm at a later date. So today I wanted to focus on um, egg quality. Um, so we'll talk about how egg quality affects fertility. How does it affect what the yield you get? Okay, so let me, let me go here. How do I, let me see, okay. So I'll go to my next step. When we refer to egg quality, we're actually referring to the ability of the egg to be fertilized and to yield a viable embryo that has a reasonable chance of actually implanting into the embryo and developing a term. So it sounds very simple, but for you to have a baby at the end of the road, you have to start all the way back at the level of the eggs. Let's look at the building block of the eggs. The most important factor in the egg is actually the DNA inside the egg. And I've put this slide up to show you um, how important it is to have a capable DNA coming from both the mother as well as the father. 
what happens is the DNA of the sperm and the egg has to be reduced from its 46 um, chromosome, um, uh, 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 what would I say, the 46 chromosomes that you have in an adult woman uh, or adult man, that has to be torn down to uh, 23 chromosomes in an egg. And that fertilizes with another sperm that has 23 chromosomes and you yield, you yield a normal embryo, okay? And that's what this is describing in terms of the egg being fertilized with um, sperm to yield a normal embryo. Well, how does that happen? You have to go to the level of the DNA. What happens is in an egg, the chromosome of the egg has to be um, separated down so you, you have your chromosome from um, the egg being pulled apart so you have one, um, one unit of DNA in the egg. Um, it has to be reduced to this level in order to combine with the DNA of the sperm, okay? So how does that happen? The biggest thing is when you are getting the, um, the um, egg ready and prepared to be fertilized, it takes a lot of energy to move the DNA um, to where you need it so that it can actually be fertilized. Part of the problem that decreases for, part of the problem that decreases the quality of the egg is if you have anything that decreases the ability or decreases the production of energy that's needed to actually result in the uh, division of the egg. Let me show you this little movie. I think I've shown you before. Um, uh, I think it, it goes by very, very fast. So I'm gonna go one more time and I'll try to show, stop it where I, okay, stop, start it. Uh, okay, when the egg is ready to start being divided, the DNA within the egg has to line up along the pole in the nucleus. Then you have a center set at each pole that will now generate what is called a microtubule. This center here requires a lot of energy to generate Think of it as a, a pulley rope that goes to the DNA in the middle of the cell and pulls it apart. You need an incredible amount of, of energy. That energy is, is found in what is called the mitochondria. We have found out what happens as a woman gets older. First off, you do decrease the quantity of eggs you have, but the competency of those eggs go down. The problem is as you are exposed to environmental toxins, or maybe in some cases, maybe genetic, um, you may encounter things that decrease the ability of the mitochondria to release that burst of energy to pull the DNA apart, all right? Most of the things that hinder this separation has to do with anything that would increase inflammation in the body. And I'm gonna go into that later. So for this to happen, and of course, um, this you know, has been sped up, but it happens fairly rapidly in cell division. You need a lot of energy to separate that DNA from 46 to 23. And then you see it now it separates again. So you get four sister chromatids from each one division. All right, so bear this in mind as we talk about potential things that could disrupt this. Okay. So a lot of energy is being used up even before you get to where you can even fertilize the egg. Now, when you fertilize the egg, the DNA that was pulled apart for a reason, it's reduced in a process called meiosis, has to be paired up with a comparable chromosome from 
from um, the sperm. And then they replicate, they double, and they also shuffle each other up so that you come out with a totally different combination of DNA than you started with. And that's why two siblings cannot be 100% alike. And once that process takes place, the resulting embryo undergoes its own rapid division as well, right? So it immediately starts to divide first into two cells, then into four cells, then eight cells, then a rapid division to where it becomes what we call the blastocyst, where the cells that will form the baby are populated at the bottom and the parts that will form the placenta or afterbirth surrounds the, the uh, baby in this ring-like fashion called the blastocyst. So you see there's a, a lot of energy being expended, a lot of division going on. There are a lot of things that could yield problems when this whole, think of it as a perfectly choreographed ballet dance takes place. If you introduce an insult during this phase of development, you are going to have abnormal genes resulting in the embryo that may either A, not implant in the, baby, the mother's womb, B, implant and stop growing, you have a miscarriage, C, implant and be genetically abnormal, you have an, an abnormal fetus, some of which may survive, some are not compatible with life, and so on and so forth. So I just showed you two rapid choreographed sequence of events that takes place before you even get to where um, you are going to see the embryo. Now, what can you do to aid this whole sequence of events? Um, keep in mind that, and I digress, I'm, I apologize. I was making slides up until a few hours ago. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are not in my slides. And I hope that gives us room for further discussion at another meeting. But you see, I showed you how the DNA is separated. You need a burst of energy to do this. And then you partner with the sperm and then rapid division goes on. If you have a highly in inflammatory environment, this whole process is thrown off track, right? I can even yield to people having recurrent pregnancy losses. So the most common thing that causes this, and the most common abnormality you have is in the chromosome, which I showed you and I showed you why, is if you have an insult at an early phase of this, what are the potential insults? Let me turn my AC up a little bit. Um, things like contaminants in your environment. And I know that we've discussed this ad nauseum in this forum, but most people don't know things like BPA, your bisphenols, your phthalates, they can act as endocrine disruptors. So they disrupt the brain's ability to choreograph this event by interfering with the hormones needed for some of this activity. Where do you get some of those things? If you eat hot food made or prepared in a plastic container, you will leach off phthalates into your diet that can have this effect. And indeed there are studies that showed that women who have a higher level of phthalates in them have a higher incidence of miscarriage and also have a higher incidence of infertility. So try to eliminate, you're not going to perfectly eliminate it because it's everywhere. What you can do is try to reduce the highest culprits. Um, and, and you can easily research products that have phthalates and BPA and try to avoid some of them. But what most people don't know, things like uh, perfume, deodorants, um, lotion, makeup, 
um, you know, nail polish, some of this have a higher than other events. Um, so you can actively look for products that have lower levels and, and they may be advertised as such. Now, some of the things advertised as that are really truly not that free. So you really have to do your homework and know where you're getting things from. I know that I think Whole Foods, they sell deodorants and, and um, some of their antiperspirants uh, with low BPA, or they try to make sure it's organic in that event. But be careful of that. Now, if you have a high level of folate, um, of this phthalates or whatever, there are some supplements that may negate some of these effects. And, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the supplements that you can use. Now, having said this, I don't want everybody to go crunch everything on this list. If you're taking two to three supplements, they are called antioxidants. That's probably fine um, because they're, and they're, I'll hopefully mention some that are harmful that you don't want to ingest. Vitamin D, we talked about that. That's the vitamin of life, isn't it? Um, we now know that it's critical in that process you 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 saw just now. Um, and it also works as an antioxidant. Um, most people are vitamin deficient. So you might be interested in having your doctor check your vitamin D level because you may need to supplement it or may need to initially boost it up um, with a high dose and then maintain uh, a higher dose of um, um, vitamin D to keep you at that level. I recommend a vitamin, a prenatal vitamin um, uh, formulation that has, in, for younger women, it has 2000 of vitamin D in it. And for women older than 35, it actually bumps it up to 35, uh, to 3000. Folic acid. The key thing with folic acid is it's very difficult to see folic acid in the right amount in your over-the-counter preparations, right? So you might see some vitamins that claim to be the best, but they only have like 400 uh, of folic acid. That's not enough. That's just not enough. Um, an adequate amount should be about a thousand uh, folic acid. And also you might want to check that you have the folic acid in the bioavailable form. The bioavailable form of folic acid is methylfolate, right? There are some people that have genetic mutations where they cannot convert some of the commercially available folic acid to the bioavailable form. Um, you can easily get this uh, uh, checked out um, if you want, ask your doctor to run a genetic test or simply just take a, 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 brand, a brand that has the bioavailable form. So I the, the brand I recommend has the bioavailable form. The only time you worry about it is if you are intolerant of the bioavailable form, um, you might want to take a lower dose. Vitamin B12 is another antioxidant um, that may help in, in, you know, in, in reducing uh, what we call oxidative stress. What is oxidative stress? In the process of carrying out its business, your, your machinery that releases energy in the cells it's going to give off what we call free radicals. And you need something to sponge up these free radicals so they don't cause damage within the DNA as it's moving around doing its job. All these supplements are labeled antioxidants and they help to reduce the oxidative stress. For some older women, I might add melatonin at night because melatonin and DHEA in older women uh, who have a low um, ovarian reserve may actually help to, um, it acts as an as a antioxidant. One thing that I do recommend for women over the age of 35 and women who have a low ovarian reserve, even if they are younger, is CoQ10. Um, and I think we've talked a lot about CoQ10 in this formula. It's a great antioxidant, but you have to be careful that you also are taking it in a form in which it can be absorbed. 
um, you know, the brand I use has a polymer form that makes it readily available um, to the system. So it has been linked to improving um, egg quality. Other things you can use include N, um, L acetylcysteine. Um, again, uh, this works at the level of glutathione. Um, but like I said, you don't need to take everything on this list. Um, there are some places where they've given women with uh, recurrent pregnancy losses and acetyl, uh, L acetylcysteine and alpha lipoic acid that are both antioxidants. And the same inflammatory process um, that we talked about decreasing air quality may also be associated with um, patients who have recurrent pregnancy loss. So if all else fails, you can add it to, to this patient. One of the things that I'll point out, hopefully we'll get to it, is a lot of this supplements and coenzymes you can actually also get it in your food. I like to eat my vitamins, as I say, and we'll talk about some of the things that I share with my patients. Um, let's see. Um, vitamin E, we talked about myo-inositol. Myo-inositol is helpful. Um, it helps in the glucose pathway. Um, it's helpful in patients who have PCO patients, uh, PCO polycystic ovary syndrome. So my PCO patients, I'll supplement them with myonositol as well as a, the core vitamin I use. DHEA am I given my older patients who have diminished ovarian reserve. Um, all right, so one of the things I give my patients and that come in is I talk about what can you do to um, prepare your body. Now, the, the thing about your eggs is you the egg that you ovulate in, in one month is actually pre-selected and has started growing two or three months down the line. So if you want to influence your eggs um, and say you want to get pregnant by Christmas, then you want to start watching what you put in your body, what supplements you give your body, what you do with your body six to eight weeks before the time that you intend. You want to boost that the quality of those eggs by decreasing the toxins I talked about by taking some supplements that might help you and also what you eat, what you eat. So again, you know, this has been talked ad nauseum. These are the kind of diets that will decrease inflammation, right? Think decrease inflammation as a systemic effect. By the way, I like to think that when you decrease your overall inflammation, you live longer anyway. You have a lower risk of heart problems. You have a lower risk of dementia. Your brain functions better. You know, your eggs and your sperm will love it for it. Avoid trans fat. Um, one of the tricky things I like to say is if it's solid on, at room temperature, well, you know, it doesn't take rocket science to see what it's doing to your body, right? So avoid trans fat. Um, you know, you want to use, you look at the oils that you use in, in cooking. Um, olive oil has been shown to be very good. And if you like to heat your stuff, like I like to air fry my plantains, I use avocado oil because it doesn't break down under heat. Uh, choose the carbohydrates that, do, that will break down slowly, right? Your local yams, African yams will do that. Rice, it's gonna break down right, right, right away and spike your glucose in no time. So you probably wanna cut down that rice, bread, pasta, and choose your slow carbs instead. Get, you know, look at the kinds of vegetables you're eating, gives you extra iron. Um, I always say drink to your health. I love, love, love water. Um, and I'm on a sparkling mineral water binge right now. So I tell my, if you can't, if you don't like to taste of regular water, go with sparkling water. And I'll put a plug in for Costco. I think they have the best tasting, tasting sparkling water and it's in a can. Check your weight. It's very, very difficult to get pregnant 
if you're out of what we call the fertility zone. So I have some patients who have a BMI, um, you know, in excess of 40. Yes, we can get them pregnant, but it's a little harder. So I try to work with them with trying to decrease that BMI because sometimes they just don't respond or if they respond, they have more complications. And then um, the following is just a, uh, I won't bore you too much with it. I'll fly through it. Uh, these are part of the list I give my patients. It doesn't tell them you have to eat this. It just tells them what kinds of food will have what kind of nutrients in it. And you can see what you, you know, if you like, you know, if you don't like oranges, well, kiwis are very good with vitamin C or strawberry. Make sure you're eating organic strawberry because they are one of the dirty fruits out there that soak up a lot of um, um, what's it, it's pesticides and insecticides. Oh, I, yeah, I'm sorry, you can't see this. We just talked about plant-based proteins. I think you guys have talked about this ad nauseum. I love, love, love nuts and I love lentils and beans, but it's a plant-based protein is rich and it's good, tasty. Eggs, what can eggs do for you? You know, I don't eat eggs that much anyway, but if you do eat eggs, it's as high in the B complex vitamins um, that are important. It, has, it also has choline for fetal growth. Uh, the vitamin that I recommend for my patients actually has choline in it. So, um, you know, if you don't like eggs, if you take the Theralogix Logics brand of vitamins, um, you'll get this supplemented. Um, and eggs also are rich in biotin, folic, B12, if you want the natural. Um, what is tomatoes good for? High in lipopene, which is very good for, um, it, it helps with sperm motility. Make sure it's not contaminated with your pesticides. Um, because it can be. Um, yogurt, if you are not allergic to dairy, um, can help improve your biome, has high zinc, which we know is also an antioxidant. So um, if you like me, you don't like to take zinc as a supplement, then do yogurt. I love yogurt with some granola mixed in there. You get your zinc supplementation. Berries, I love, love, love berries. Um, they have just very rich in antioxidants. The more color you have in your fruits and vegetables, the more antioxidants you're going to have. So if you do the color mech, you just put a, a whole rainbow of color on your plate. I think you'll be um, um, covering a lot. So I have come to the end of my slide. I'm sorry I talked too long. Um, and I will entertain questions. Thank you so very much. and. No, you did not talk too long. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Thank you. Amazing. It goes beyond the quality of eggs and you know, uh, getting the body ready for pregnancy. This talks about prevention of disease entities, even prevention of cancer, things you mentioned. Yes. But I'm going to have others ask questions before me. I think, um, Auntie Tower, you have your hand raised, ma. I'll, I'll reserve my questions for now. Go ahead, ma. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Famuiwa. Thank you for the information. It's, yeah. a, it's a wonderful information and very loaded. But all the time you are talking about the uh, over. What about the spam? It takes you to tango. Absolutely. Because I, as I said, I don't know if you, you were here when we start. I told Dr. Um, o that, you know, maybe we should, because I think that would be a, a whole lecture by itself. Um, because if we try to talk about both, I don't know that we'll get in, in much depth. But you're right. It's very important. And, um, you know, um, we will talk about that. Now, by the way, a lot of the things that help improve egg quality will also help improve sperm quality, right? But there are other things you can do for the sperm as well. But bear in mind, there are a lot of things that, you know, because basically what it is, is you're trying to live your healthiest life possible. I mean, shoot, who doesn't want to live to be like Queen Elizabeth and die at over 96? I mean, I'm aiming for 100. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about things that you can do and implement 
that will hopefully get you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an excellent question. And yes, and an excellent answer because I mean, these are loaded, loaded information. I have questions. Yes, ma'am. Or, you know, input the plastics. Yeah. You know, we've heard a lot about plastics on this platform. Correct. We learned also that when you cook your food, you should not, when it's still hot, don't put it in plastic because the phthalates would um, seep into it. Yeah. We learned that put it in a glass container, let it cool, put it and let it even get cold in the refrigerator if you want, if you have to freeze it in plastic before you put it in the plastic. Uh, I came to the conclusion that I need to get rid of all the plastics in my home. <laughs> That's what I need to do so that we don't need to worry about it. So you mentioned today that these phthalates are in uh, in cosmetics. Yes. Also. Can you yes. say can you say some more about that? Yes, you know you, you have to be careful. Um, most cosmetics don't put the ingredients in there, right? But if you start doing your homework and digging a little deep, you can come up with which which ones are loaded with some of these chemicals that are actually toxic to your body. Um, so you you know just as much as you eat organic food. Maybe you should be looking at organic um, um, makeup, organic lotions, deodorants. I mean, when I read and, and found out more about this, I changed my deodorant. I, I use one that's, oh, it's based on oats and it's natural based and it works. So without feeling like I'm putting toxins in my body. Now, another thing that is concerning is um, you can get phthalates on paper receipts, you know, the thermal receipts you get when you go to the grocery store. So when you get home, wash your hands, wash your hands, because if you've dealt with, you know, paper receipts and stuff, you will have some on your hands. Um, one of the things I read was it could also be present in, um, you can have phthalates in the laundry, what do I call it, the laundry um, um, Detergent. Yeah, your your laundry, what you might call it, um, can give you phthalates. Um, so you have to look at your or what the um, for um, uh, softeners. Your your softener. Your um, what those you, those um. Those paper softeners that you put in the dryers? Drying sheets. Yes, exactly. The drying sheets. Exactly. Exactly. They have phthalates? Yes, they do. They do. They do. <laughs> so you want to be careful with, with that. Uh, it does it, they do have phthalates in them. Um, and you said receipts from the stores also. Correct. Correct. Wow. Because those have thermal, um, the thermal paper that you use, those have high um, phthalate content in there. Yeah. Interesting. So this goes beyond just eggs because this, are can this is a carcinogenic. Correct. Substance. Cancer causing. I, I think that, you know, a lot of people, I, especially I think in the Nigerian community, um, I think people are used to um, cooking and warming stuff with plastic. You know, they don't think anything of microwaving their rice or fufu in a plastic bowl, right? Um, you just wonder how much of the plastic is going into their system when they microwave it. It's almost like a double whammy on your system, but a lot of people consume plastics. And there are now, if you go to a functional medicine person, they can do tests where they can find out what are all the toxins in your body. And you might be surprised how much microplastics are in your system. Um, you know, I, I, I think that most people, if they knew, they would be shocked, you know. So try to avoid plastics. Another thing I was reading, um, if you prepare hot tea, well, don't drink tea or coffee if you're trying to improve your egg. Caffeine is not good for you. But 
if you have a, 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 a machine that has a lot of plastic parts, um, if you do, you can have increased um, plastic leaching off and phthalates from that. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. So, um, Dr. Bin Wu, as a hand raised, please unmute yourself. Thank you. There you go. I got one question. I think, uh, how about the patient just to take the multivitamin? That's enough or need to separate the, for the multivitamin? So vitamins? Yeah, I saw you give a lot of folly. So how can I people get the, the supplement? They just to take one multivitamin, that's enough? Well, see, the, 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 the multivitamins in a regular, the ingredients in a regular multivitamin capsule is not enough for people trying to get pregnant, right? Wow. So for people who are trying to get pregnant or surgical patients, you need a higher dose of vitamin D and you need a higher oh. dose of folic acid. So the regular vitamin D or the folic acid is not enough, is not enough. Oh, so the melatonin also yeah. is good to take for people. Yes, so melatonin is good if you're trying to get pregnant because melatonin uh -huh. acts as an antioxidant as well, right? So yeah. all things reduce that oxidative stress, oh. inflammation in your body. Anything we're talking about decreases inflammation. All okay. these supplements I told you decreases inflammation. There are some supplements out there that people are using incorrectly. Um, I didn't get to put this on the slide, but you have, there are some people who use something called a picnogel, picnogenil. Uh, um, it's not naturally made in humans. There are no studies uh, involving human eggs, so I would not res recommend it. There's another supplement called Royal Jelly that is produced by mm -hmm. bees, mainly for the queen bees. It's not naturally made in the human body. So it's not something that you should do. L-arginine is not also something that you should um, um, ingest. It, it can be harmful to your eggs. So you want to avoid uh, them as well. If, uh, another question is, if a patient eats enough the vegetable, green leaf vegetable, do they need to take the uh, supplement? So it depends on, well, we definitely recommend vitamin D. I don't know that you can, you can consume enough of it um, or expose yourself to enough sun. So I think most people do need vitamin supplementation. You do need mm -hmm. to check your vitamin D levels, right? So uh, you need to supplement with vitamin D. Um, it's, it's not even enough if you, if you look at it that way. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And that is so true. And there isn't enough vitamin D in milk, as people believe. It's, you, you can't get your vitamin D from milk. You yes. just supplement. Exactly. exactly. We also recommend that you don't stay in the sun without sunscreen mm -hmm. because of cancer. Correct. You know, and so... Um, Going to lie down in the sun is not what we recommend uh, as a source of you getting your vitamin D. And, you know, things that are high in vitamin D, tuna, mackerel, uh, salmon. You know, Dr. Jagwe sent me something about fishes, the mercury, the mercury level in fishes uh, a, few days, a few days ago. And we will talk about that sometime on Medical Mondays. Cool. I was like, whoa. I think it's important to know, you know, the mercury levels and even Correct. without that. Correct. Like when on, um, I do have a brochure I give to my patients listing the types of food. I, I borrowed some of it for the slides I gave you. Wow. I do specifically point out that they have to be careful with things like tuna because tuna is one of the culprits that have a high mercury level. So you want to go with fish like, you know, um, um, wow. <laughs> 
salmon, snapper, snapper. Um, so there are other right. it's tuna. Yeah. Thank you so much. That is important. I think something disturbed you a little bit there that you have yeah. to be careful yeah. about uh, about tuna. Yeah. Yeah, because of the high mercury level. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Ajagbe. Sir, you can um, unmute, sir, to ask your question. Thank you, Dr. Fami. You are, um, I know you mentioned something about uh, hormones. Uh, you talk a little bit about prolactin level as it affects the quality of eggs. Well, you know, the first thing with, with prolactin is um, not just affecting the eggs, it can also um, it can also disrupt your menstrual cycle. So it it can de uh, um, affect ovulation. So it does de disrupt ovulation. So it, it, you want to I usually check uh, prolactin levels, especially in patients who have irregular menstrual cycles. You want to know one of the reasons they may have irregular cycles, is because they have a high pituitary level that could be from, um, it could be from a pituitary adenoma. So those are the things we check. Um, you know, I, I, usually, I usually screen my patients for prolactin level. I know I didn't mention it, but it's really important as well is to make sure the first thing you wanna do is go get a dental checkup when, when you are trying to get pregnant. So again, you want to decrease inflammation, right? You want to decrease inflammation um, because in excess inflammation can decrease uh, fertilization and egg quality as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, melatonin, I almost forgot that I wanted to say something then I saw Dr. Ajagwe's hand. Um, sleep is very important in life. Another thing melatonin would do is it helps you sleep. That rest is very important. And wait, oh my gosh, you mentioned something about insulin, you know, um, in one of those slides. And you talked about weight, about the BMI, that is the height compared to the, to the weight, what it should be. Normal should be 19 to 24. <laughs> 19 to 24. The BMI, when you compare your height to your weight. So when people have weight, then they have a problem with, you know, um, insulin doing what it's supposed to do, where it's supposed to do it. And so the sugar goes up and that affects pregnancy as a whole, or is it the egg it affects? Is my question. It does affect uh, fertilization. You have too much sugar. And also remember sugar is also a uh, highly inflammatory substance. The more you have um, high sugar levels, the more you're gonna have an inflammatory state. So overall, just bad news for the egg quality and also your lifestyle as well. So talking of lifestyle, I have a question. Is it okay for a pregnant woman to exercise? That's a... So what we normally advise women is if you've been, if you've been exercising um, since before you got pregnant, you probably are okay because that's something you've been doing all along, right? You don't get pregnant and all of a sudden decide you want to become a marathon Olympic champion, right? That's not normal. But if it's something that you've been, you're used to and you maintain on a regular basis, you're probably going to be fine, right? It's when it's not normal or consistent for you then that can um, be bad for pregnancy. But for most people who've been um, exercising consistently, I think you'll find their doctor say, you know, you're probably okay because you've been doing it for forever and a day. Um, when you get to your third trimester, obviously, you know, you might want to think twice about, you know, doing something that maybe make it more uh, uncomfortable. Um, Thank you. So... I see a lot of women who are over 45 coming into the clinics uh, because they want to have a child or children. 
never been pregnant or, uh, you know, for what, or had one child, most of the time never been pregnant and want to have a child, but they're now 45 and over. What's your take on that? Well, at that age, it is extremely difficult to conceive with assisted reproductive technology, but not only is it difficult to conceive because you have poor quality eggs and fewer eggs, um, Remember I showed you the machinery that holds the eggs where they divide and and you know and then just pull apart and and all that machinery it breaks down with time and the body cannot adequately fix it that's why you see the percentage of abnormal embryos steadily rises as a woman gets older right so at age in your 20 30s you know you might have about a 20 some percentage um, incidents of uh, uh, aneuploidy, right? When you're over 42-ish, you're almost at almost at 100%, um, 90 to 100% abnormality rate, right? So it's just that you have a higher incidence of abnormal cells. And, and, and at that age, it's almost 100. When you test the DNA, it's almost all abnormal. So that's the problem. It's one thing to get the egg. It's another thing for the egg to actually be uh, normal and fertilized normal, normally. So the problem is you just get such a high percentage of um, unemployed or abnormal embryos. So at that point, their best chance of getting pregnant is to consider donor egg. So question. You know, we have women in our culture who naturally get pregnant at 50. I've seen one, I think it was 60, 62, it was in the papers or something, but it was natural, not. Yes. So. And with vibrant, healthy babies. True. And I think people come up to me and say, you know, my aunt got pregnant at 48 and 49. And, and certainly we have patients who may spontaneously get pregnant on their own, right? But when you take the whole group as a whole, like if we as clinicians are trying to initiate that process, the success rate is probably in the order of 1% or less. So if you look at uh, statistics and success rates, it just really just plummets at that age. So if it works by nature and you get pregnant, Wonderful, more power to you. But as far as technology getting you there, the success rate is so low. You know, um, I know in parts of Europe, they have done things like, you remember I told you that, that the machinery that moves those DNA around and, and powers the movement of, this, of, the, of or the organelles inside the, the, the egg and in the embryo feeds off energy from the mitochondria. Your mitochondria is your ATP powerhouse. So as a woman gets older, the number of ATP you have in your mitochondria, it's, it's lower. You don't have that burst of energy to move things around. So there are cases, I think in Europe, and I know in Ukraine, they were doing it for a while, where they took the uh, nucleus from um, a, 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 a donor egg and out, and they took the nucleus out, and they try to put the nucleus of a donor egg inside the mato, inside the cytoplasm of the mother, with the thought that there's some mitochondrial DNA might contribute something. It's not allowed in America, right? Um, but there, I know there are parts of the world where they're looking at that. So you're trying to shortchange a process that continues with aging, right? and you're trying to short change that and move it back, it's very hard to. It's easier to A, freeze your eggs while you're young, B, supplement. If you know you're going to conceive, start supplementing and doing things to clean your body up so that when you attempt it, you are attempting with the healthiest eggs possible. You know, I know a lot of women who have, you know, thought about, oh yeah, you know what, I'll go freeze my eggs, I'm 40 or I'm 42 and, and they shell out a lot of money 
And then five years down the road, they are 46, 47, and they thaw these eggs and, and, and it just really just falls apart, right? The eggs are really just not that good. So it that quality really matters and, and it, it does go down with age. So I implore all women, all professional women too, all working mothers, all working men, if you think you want to have your own DNA in a child down the road, then you want to consider freezing your eggs, right? By age 30, 32. If you suspect you have endometriosis, you might even want to consider freezing your eggs a lot earlier, okay? So it's easy to deal with that than to try and um, um, reverse engineer an egg at age 48. <sighs> And you know, I know we're not talking about spam today. Freezing the spam too has become important. Oh, absolutely. We do. Know know that. We yeah, yes. The DNA fragmentation in the sperm, the same insults that affects the egg, we now show that uh, affects the sperm. So if you have a high oxidative stress, these free radicals can also damage the sperm DNA. So the sperm fragmentation in, starts to increase with age. So a man at age 45 is less fertile than he was at age 35, right? And when you do conceive as you get older, the incidence of other things, autism, schizophrenia, um, starts to go up with fathers who conceive later. It, it's not 100%, right? Because then you'll say, well, my grandpa fathered, you know, half the village or something like that. <laughs> but but if you look at population as a whole, then you see that it trends to increased abnormality. So now, yes, yes, for men, and you know, there's no, well, you know, at least for men, you know, if you're thinking about it, you know, the perfect madam hasn't come along, um, freeze your sperm wherever, whatever stage of life you are in, freeze your sperm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Auntie Tower, you have your hand raised, ma. please, on mute. Thank you. Dr. Fang, where you are? Yes, ma'am. How long can you keep your egg when it is frozen? When Indefinitely. Indefinitely, as long as you pay the storage people to keep them. If you start paying them, they'll chuck it. And, oh, it, will still be okay. Okay. and it will be viable whenever you need it. Yes, it will. Okay, thank you. How expensive is it? Um, it's okay. not that expensive, depending on where you do it. Um, anywhere from, you know, 6,900 to, depend on the clinic you go to, 1,500. And then you have to factor in the cost of medication. The cost is related to how well you respond. So if you freeze your eggs at a much younger age, um, you know, like 30, 32, it'll be a lot cheaper than you, you know, at 37, 36, when you may need more medication. So um, do your homework um, and not just looking at the cost, but also looking at the um, technique they use in freezing and how comfortable they are and what how easy is it for the same center to thaw those eggs, right? What is their thaw rate before you go? I know we have a wonderful embryologist from China who I call her my embryo magician. Um, she has an incredible thaw rate of over 95% and, and is highly skilled. Um, so if you give her good eggs, you're going to come out with good eggs. Yeah, so that rate is a yearly, 1,500 to 6,900. Is it yearly or monthly? Oh, no, no, no. Um, we're not talking storage. Storage is cheap. Storage is, depending on where you store it, storage is anywhere from 50 to to $100 a month. Um, some even store less because they store in batch. So storage is, is cheap, you know. Um, we, we charge $50 a month, but I don't keep it long-term. If you want to go long-term, we recommend that you transfer to some, I call it storage depots that can hold it forever and a day in hurricane, you know, earthquake, fire, um, they have protections and they don't charge that much. Thank you. Dr. Wu, Dr. Bean, 
you had your hand raised before I asked my next question. Yes, I got one question. I'm sorry to ask. Uh, you help your patient to keep the good the mitochondria function, the fun function. The mitochondria is more important, you say. Well, to the extent that your mitochondria is where your ATPs are produced, ATPs are your, you know, think of it as your nuclear power plant that produce the voltage needed to send the electricity out to the rest of the, the cells. So if you deplete those, uh, the power plant of the essential ingredient it needs, like the, the supplements we talked about, it will not be able to generate that burst of energy you need to start moving. So what happens is when you're supposed to move a chromosome to one end of the mm -hmm. um, nucleus or the other, and you can't, one is gonna lag behind, right. right? And so you might end up with more than you need in one spot or fewer than you need in one spot. So when you fertilize that egg, you're gonna get an aneuploid embryo. My question is uh, how, how do you help your patient to keep the good? The how function? do I help to do what? Um, and have, um, to keep the patient, have the good mitochondria, how could increase the mitochondria? Well, again, you know, all the things we've talked about, right? Yeah. Healthy all life, the diseases diet, come. Um, diet, your supplements, your vitamins, all those things feed into the same thing. Right? Yeah, because so, mitochondria is mostly important for cancer also. For okay. everything almost. Huh? So in that wonderful for the aging, if you, if you it, the the most important thing that disrupts your mitochondria is a high yeah. inflammatory state, right? Which is what we talked about. So if you have the appropriate antioxidants, you help to improve and help them. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So it's all of those things, the diet, the supplements. The style. Uh, yeah. Yes. And you are absolutely right, Dr. Wu. Cancer also. We keep talking about that because there's so much going on now. And that's why, you know, it's very interesting that it doesn't matter what speaker has come on this forum. They talk about what we put in our bodies. Correct. It's very important that we start paying attention and to start reading labels to know what's in those things because things are, you know, are camouflaged sometimes if you don't read the labels. So I have a question. This is a real life person. I can't remember if you if you even know this one. No, you don't. Well, maybe, maybe you do. So I had a patient who was, I think, 48 and wanted to, you know, uh, have assisted, you know, uh, no, did not want to use donor egg. Correct. So a center for MRI and radiology said, she's fantastic. The her eggs look fantastic, but she was refused the ability to even harvest the eggs. Did, did you mean the ovaries? No. So, okay. so probably, you know, what are they talking about? They saw antro follicles. Is that what they define as okay? Because it's not know. the same. But the thing is, what the question, the, the, what I didn't understand is that this person is willing to pay the money is willing to take our chances on the eggs. We have ability now to actually look at the egg and decide, okay, this is good for implantation. Okay, so, not. That, yeah, well, okay, so that has a lot of things tied to it. Um, you know, I have seen patients who have tried in the past to stimulate them. I had a 46 year old that I stimulated I got like 22 eggs from her. And I was like, oh, wow, you know what? Well, whoop de doo you know, um, we got this many eggs. Well, that's just quantity, not quality. I mean, the legs were literally falling apart on the Petri dish right in front of you. So the eggs may be there, but they're not competent. And when you try to fertilize them, they fall apart. So, 
you know, and then you have to understand there's something in medicine where you have to be very, very careful. If she has her money, she will eventually get someone who will stimulate her, right? Her chances of getting pregnant is essentially like 1% or less, right? So I think that in the medical community, we owe our patients the responsibility to say your chances are this low, right? Why would you want to give me money for it? And if you want to give me money, put it in the brown paper bag and give it to me at Christmas and let, you know, let me know you're giving me a Christmas gift. But for me to take that money, knowing the statistics, I think I'm doing the patient a disservice, right? You have to be honest with it. I've seen patients who come to see me and they bring their records and I look at it and I go, gee whiz, I could have told you that it wouldn't work, you know, based on what I'm seeing. Why did you go through it? So the way I look at it is, look, what I tell my patients, when you have a pile of money and you say, okay, I want to conceive with this pile of money, you want to pull that pile on what's going to give you the highest success rate. Now, that may very well mean that you put that pile towards exploring resources for adopting, right? I mean, that way is 100% success because you know what you're getting before you put your money down. But if you put, you know, um, if you're stimulating someone in their older age and they pay 20, 25,000 for something that might yield the less than 1% success rate versus putting that 25,000 or whatever it is towards a donor egg. Now they may need more depending on what they do, but has a success rate of 70%, where would you put your money? You know, I had a patient once where I had to convince the husband to stop and she was 45 and oh gosh, you know, please, please, please. You know, I, I, you know, I just really need to do this. And, you know, and the husband said, well, and I think she was 44. And the husband said, well, you know what? I love my wife so much and, you know, I'm willing to pay. The, the first cycle got eggs, but they were really bad. This was even before the day of PGT where you could test the embryo. And I told them, look, your egg quality is really bad. You, you would have a high chance with donor egg, right? But, oh, please, you know, oh, I'd love to, really love to. And I found out they were mortgaging their house to do this with a very low success rate. So I told, the, I told the husband, I said, look, let me ask you a question. If you had a child that saw a bonfire and says, daddy, I really, really just want to jump into that fire just real quick, just for two seconds, would you really let them? If you love that child, wouldn't you say, well, I don't think that's a good idea, you know, and, and, and actively say, well, why don't we go pursue something that has a better chance? Um, yes, there are clinics out there trying to do ovarian rejuvenation. And I've had patients come to see me and they've done, I wouldn't even mention names of things that they've done, right? But the outcome is still poor. And at the end of the day, they still need donor eggs. Now, if they conceive, it's you'll be hard pressed to say it was because of whatever was done, right? Maybe just, just got, like the woman we talked about and she got pregnant on her own. But at the end of the day, and there have been studies on this, there have been reports about from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, that at the end of the day, the reproductive endocrinology world has a responsibility to these women to give them, to not give false hope. Like when I tell someone, your chance is, is really very low, they don't hear that. What they hear instead is, oh gosh, you know, that means I have a 1% chance and, and maybe I'm the 1%. You know what I mean? So they don't hear what you're saying. And, and people have gone bankrupt trying to do things that have a low yield. You know, now if you have, yeah, maybe your uncle owns, you know, Google or something like that, and you can pour money on it, you can try whatever you want. And then if you say 50,000, I, I know personally, I know a, 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 a patient of mine who had been through like probably six or seven different shops around town. 
And when I add up how much money she spent in all those shops, I mean, easily, I'm sure she spent over 500,000. I mean, she had the funds. She, she was well off. But it, regardless of that, she's still pouring money and, and people were helping to separate her from her money. And she's still, I think she ended up adopting, right? So she has a child now that's just a sweet child. You wouldn't even know unless I told you she was adopted. So there is a time where we need to sit down with our patients and be honest with them, you know, and be honest. I agree. Thank you. You know what? I love the fact that in medicine, we do realize that there is 1%, 3%. Seriously, that's what contraceptive failure rate, 0.3%. It's not even 1%, zero. 0.3%, 0.3%, right? And people get pregnant Correct. on contraceptive pill on that 0.3%. We know our limitations. Um, I appreciate, you know, your outlook and it's very important. I praise God for this country, America. In America, the truth is told to patients. All of my patients, 100% who come to me that the fertility doctor said, I have but at the end of the day, it is still their choice. And yes, they may end up being that 1%. I'll always remember that oral contraceptive uh, percentage. I remember yeah, see, when I was in residency. Oh, see, I agree with you when I, I hear what you're saying. No, you know, no. I wanted to say something. When I was in residency, I participated in uh, a bilateral tubal ligation where we cut and burnt the tube. I was a tight one, I assisted in the surgery. And she got pregnant. And she got pregnant. Right, because sometimes you can overdo it. What, what, what happened, did the, did the egg? Well, well, you have a tube <laughs> that you- She wanted to sue. Well, look, 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 you cut it and you burnt it. And, and you damage the ability of the tissue to heal properly. So you can form a fistula where that lumen was. No. So but we, we cut it <laughs> and we bunt, we bunt that end. We bunt one end there and we bunt the other end there. And those are the ones <laughs> that can fail the most again, because okay. you decrease the ability of that tissue to heal when you burn it that way. We bought I mean, it. The, the, we the, 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 this was years ago. This was, yeah. you know, this they, was I mean, they don't do this anymore, but but the highest, yeah, no. <laughs> the highest rate is they put a band around it, right? Not just cut it, then you put a band around it, it can erode, or you bury one end of the tube in the uterus, right? But you can't form a fistula if exactly you, if okay. you overdo it, if you over if you burn tissue, it doesn't heal well. Yeah. So if you overburn the tube, you may actually be, not be doing anything. Okay, that's my point. At that time, that was what we thought was the best to do. That was how it was done. And we, we thought the chances of you getting pregnant is a uh, nail. She got pregnant. And when she said she was going to, so I was, I was the resident who she, you know, met at the clinicals and I sat there and I'm like, you know what? I was at your surgery. <laughs> we cut, we bought. Tell me we are not God. Right. God is God. A fistula formed, the egg jumped, whatever happened, <laughs> she got pregnant, despite us. Now we have better procedures. It doesn't matter what procedure, you know, that's my point exactly. Correct. Correct. That in medicine, we, we have knowledge that God gives to us little by little through research. And we continue to evolve. It's only the word of God that doesn't change. I love and, and you know, stay tuned. It may be in the future that they're able to correct all these damages that you see in the egg. Exactly. And, and maybe 20 years from now, such an egg may become once again rejuvenated and is now completely competent. Exactly. Yeah. See, you got my point. And not because now we can choose if the egg implanted is a male or a female. 
the embryo, the embryo. The, sorry, the, the embryo. embryo. Correct. Pardon me. If the embryo is a male or a female, you can actually decide your sex. So we've evolved and God knows you're right. You know, we, we, we will keep staying tuned. Uh, Sister Hilda, you have your hand raised. Sorry, Dr. Family Wan and I are having fun. <laughs> Thank <laughs> I <didn't> forget you. <laughs> yes. We are also enjoying it. I'm so sorry I can't put my video back on uh, because of where I am. You're okay. Uh, thank you so much, doctor. Uh, I watched you your one of your programs on YouTube. So when I saw that you were coming and I said, oh, is she, maybe she's going to repeat exactly the same, but I'm so happy that this is completely different from what I watched on YouTube. So I am really very, I'm learning a lot and I'm so excited to, to listen to you. But uh, my question is about the donor egg. How does it work exactly? And uh, is there any impact on the DNA of the couple if they get a donor egg from someone, if they use someone else's egg, please? So when you have a donor egg um, and you have the eggs coming from a young person, the quality of that egg is good. So the chances of getting pregnant using donor egg is, is much higher because you're using eggs from someone younger. So you look looking at the age, the age of the egg, right? So if the age of the egg is, um, if the genetic age of the egg uh, is young, then the chance of getting pregnant is, is much higher, right? So that's why you see women who, we know that the success rate for um, pregnancy goes down with age, right? But if you have donor egg, that, that success rate goes back and reverts to the age of the egg, right? So you have the age of the egg is what, what is more important. Did that answer your question? that the age of the egg is what is important. I think she was asking about the DNA of the partners, how it comes into play. It's because this egg is not from the woman. It's from Correct. somebody else. Right. Correct. That somebody else who is younger, right. whose egg is healthy right. and you know, vibrant. Actually, there's a process to that. You, they, they get to read or, about the donor, correct? Who they are, how age they, how, how old they are, their educational level, correct? Their height, uh, color, creed, you know, stuff like that, achievements correct. and all. They get correct. to do that for the spam yeah. donors too. So yeah. I guess the she's she's wanting to know the, does the DNA of the woman somehow then uh, intertwine somewhere with the egg? No, go ahead. That's correct. So how does the, well, uh, how does it, how, what is the process of the donor egg? So you take the egg and then you implant it in the woman. And then is there any, uh, I have never done one. I have never, I, I, I don't okay, know exactly so how. You take the egg from this person that donated it and right. fertilize it with the sperm of right. usually the, the, the male sperm, the, the correct. partner. So, a question is, how does the DNA of the, the, the woman receiving the egg and the sperm that is used to fertilize it, how does their DNA work with the donor egg? So um, yeah. they, as long as the embryo is healthy, um, the embryo has a very good chance of implanting. Right, so the only thing you might worry about is if you have um, um, blood type incompatibility because you might get, um, um, you have to look at the blood type, for instance, um, of, of the mother versus the sperm. But, but having said that, um, um, well, well I, think, I, think, I think the question is still, I think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture to just answer that uh, the DNA of the donor is what would mix with the DNA of the um, 
sperm. Sperm giver. Correct. Correct. The woman receiving Correct. DNA does not will not be part of that process. She's, she's just she's going to be the carrier. Correct. And that's her baby. Correct. But a DNA is not going to be part of the process. Correct. Does that answer your question, Sister? Yes. Yes, yes that's yes. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I tried to phrase it, phrase it, but you know that's really what she wanted to know. The DNA of the woman receiving. Yeah, Doctor Jagwe, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was about to ask about the um, compatibility, um, the, the tissue compatibility, not necessarily blood compatibility. Because yeah, I mean, for people who are not conceiving or have recurrent miscarriages, there is something, and then that's you, you're talking about the very, very low percentage of patients now who may have what's called HLA incompatibility. Right, that's yeah. what I was trying so, to. Understand. So you can uh, look at HLA uh, compatibility and test for it. Um, that would not apply to the vast majority of patients. That would be a very low percentage of patients where you need to go to that extent. Okay. So there, um, there hasn't been a tissue rejection as, re as you know, after the implantation and all oh, that. So we don't really see that much when you're doing donor eggs. So tissue reception that you're talking about will be in patients who have recurrent pregnancy losses, but not in egg donors per se. Okay. Thank so, you. Okay. Thank you so much. There's a question from um, Ayat Abe that I would like Ayat Abe, I'd like you to please unmute and ask that question about um, human rate of decay slowing down, you know, human cops. I didn't understand that question, so I don't know how to ask um, Dr. Famuiwa. I'm asking you to please unmute. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Well, this was in reference to uh, the consumption of uh, residues of plastics and uh, other things that we may consume. And so I just sort of related it to, I think in the past there was mention of the human body is decaying, the corpse of a human person is delaying, is, is decaying slower than it used to be due to uh, whether it was uh, plastics or, or plastic surgery. <laughs> but uh, I was just wondering if this uh, is related to that as well. Plastic surgery versus plastics in your system? Uh, both, not versus. I, I don't think so. I think that's related. Plastic surgery is different. Plastic surgery just refers to the manipulation of um, the body, either with a knife. It's it's not doesn't mean you have plastic when you have plastic surgery. Um, well, I guess I should say uh, the uh, addition of uh, what do you call them. Um, uh, for as what is that you use for fillers in the body? Uh, oh. You know, uh, in addition to maybe plastic consumption in food. I, I was just trying to brainstorm and think, you know, because I had heard in the past there was mention of um, the rate of human corpse as far as decaying is 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 slower than it used to be. I heard that somewhere years ago, so. You I know just... what? Just a thought. I yeah. am clueless at what you said. I don't, I don't know if it's true, if the rate of uh, uh, cops of, of human body, mm -hmm. uh, if the rate of decay has slowed down or not. But just a thought that because of all the preservatives in things that are eaten, you can buy an apple and that apple should have rotted after a few days or a week where you have it there for three weeks, four weeks, and it's still looking fresh. Like what's, what, what's in it, you know? Uh, I wonder if, you know, like Dr. Famuiwa mentioned that there is testing now that can test the, the plastics in your body, you know, those, those toxins in your body, 
you know, they're there. So when somebody dies, since they're there, could preserve the body longer. <laughs> because the preservatives just a thought. I don't know. That was just that a thought. Are there. That's a thought. What do you think, Dr. Family? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> you're talking about, I, I don't know if we're going off a tangent here, but I don't know. You're talking about the preservative they put in. No, the plastics that the um the pallets. Yeah, that, we, about. We, that was when we, she asked the we question. Do, we do know that the um, phthalates are higher in patients um, who have uh, incidence of infertility and also tend to be higher in patients who have uh, recurrent pregnancy losses. So clearly associated with uh, miscarriages, clearly associated with egg quality. Um, so especially in excess excessive levels. So this was just off topic, but I thought I mentioned it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's not it's not a territory that I think any of us um, are really experts in. No worries. <laughs> I, th I think that's more of uh, environmental medicine. So, but stay tuned because we may bring somebody sometime we can you know shed more light into that that for us um there's a question that says at what age should a patient opt for donor eggs it's not so much you, at what age it depends on the egg quality and if they have any eggs at all like some patients may have um poor egg quality or they have patients who have um, decreased uh, numbers of eggs so if you have um, poorly functional eggs or quantity, then you may not, you may wow. need a donor egg at that time. So a follow-up question is, will you have to have, will you have to have some tests done to know the quality of your eggs? So quality, you cannot really estimate per se. You can estimate quantity, right? By the anti malarian hormone level because it's associated with um, the lower the, the lower the AMH level, the lower the amount of eggs that you get. Um, but it's not necessarily related to quality. Quality, you can never really get to. Right. I mean, yes, if someone is older, you know that they have poor quality eggs, you can try to weigh them and stuff. But you might also get poor quality eggs in patients who have extensive um, endometriosis, where especially if they've required surgery on their uterus, where parts of the uterus have been pulled out while they're removing ovarian, um, they're removing the endometrioma sac. So those patients will have very, very poor quality. So so if you just don't have any functional eggs, it, you know, um, so it has nothing to do with age. Someone who's, you know, had um, surgery or any kind of thing that have affected their, compromised their ovary may need donor eggs, right? There are some, yes, I mean, there are some patients, usually you think of patients in, your, in their 40s that need donor eggs, right? But there are some patients um, who have premature ovarian, we call it premature ovarian insufficiency, right? And, and that can happen at, at any younger age. And those patients will require donor egg. So the egg quality, you don't know until it's time to maybe- Exactly, the exactly. Egg. And, exactly. you know, Dr. Family Wa said it over and over again, then that you see the eggs just falling apart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she talked about the woman who had 22, eggs harvested yes, exactly and you're like yes but then it was time to fertilize and everything was just falling apart right so that's when you know um if the egg is qualitative or not yes so um auntie tower you have your hand raised yes please um will those people that have breast implant will the breast implant affect their um, 
taken in having their pre pregnancy carry up to term because of the palate or whatever, the plastic that is in breast implant. That is number one. Then you said, the second one is uh, you mentioned um, premature ovarian problem cyst. Uh, is, that, is that reversible? Um, no, it's not. It's not. Why do you say no? Because I was diagnosed with that and I have children. I don't know what happened. I, when you were- what, what were you diagnosed with? Well, yeah. Uh, um, um, ovarian cyst, premature ovarian cyst. But not, that's not what she said. That's not what she was talking. Sorry, go what, ahead. What was she talking? Not a cyst. We're not talking about cyst. Ovarian insufficiency is not the same as a cyst. Okay. Well, I think when you mentioned the uh, endometrioma, endometriosis and the endometrioma cyst, I think that's what you probably heard. When you are talking about the surgery to remove endometrioma. Right, right. I'm just saying anything, I don't think there's a set age where you say this is an age that you have to use donor egg, right? It, it's not, it, you know, any number of things can compromise compromise the ovary. So ovarian cyst is a cyst on the ovary, just what he said. So a cyst is different. We're not, yeah. we're not, I wasn't talking about a regular old cyst. I was talking about uh, endometriosis, that's different. Yeah. So ovarian, the ovaries not being able to do the work they're supposed to do is different from the ovary just having a cyst on it. Yes, exactly. So I just wanted to break it yes. down. Yes. So having a cyst, people have cysts that don't hurt or it could be painful. Yeah, cyst hurt. just simply means fluid filled, yes. right? Then you got to quantify it. What kind of cyst? Hemorrhagic cyst, endometriotic cyst, complex cyst. You know, it is, cyst is just a generic term. Is it a follicular cyst? Is it a corpus luteum cyst? You know, cyst means fluid filled. Then the characterization of exactly what kind differs. Okay. So the kind I'm talking about is a kind that actually is uh, uh, depletes and, and affects the eggs left in the ovaries in a negative manner. Thank you. What, what about the implants? Oh, oh, that's cool. that, that question, she said the um, breasts, people who have breast implants. I mean, I, I don't know that, you know, um, other than to say, okay, they're probably exposed to the same things we've talked about, right? You know, phthalates and, and BPA and whatever it else is. In, but most, uh, there are some breast implants that are simply saline nowadays. So they, they're not like the old days when they used to inject um, the, the chemicals in them that swells and everything. Um, I mean, yes, it's still in the plastic, if you will. Um, and that may leach con um, um, phthalates, but if it's saline based, um, I, I don't know, or I'm not aware of studies that have said, okay, this one is, um, going to cause more phthalates. There are a lot of things that people put in their body that may be worse, you know, and, and also you have to look at lotions. What, what, you know, cause your skin has a wider surface area, right? And so what are you lathering up with yeah. every day? You know, what exactly is in it? So you, you want to look at uh, those products as well. That's an excellent you know, point. The skin is huge. Hmm. Hmm. Dr. Farmer, I think, um, can you say something about PID or generalized infection that affects the pelvic so, cavity? So, so the mechanism of that, again, is inflammation. PID is pelvic inflammatory disease, right? Hmm. Can be caused by chlamydia, by gonorrhea. Um, you know, if you have a tubal ovarian abscess, um, that is a very inflammatory and, and you have thick masses of pus in your, in your tummy, uh -huh. you know, you're going to have inflammatory products that it, a lot of times it, it destroys the tubes, mostly blocks the tubes. So that is something that um, hopefully should be appropriately treated um, before women try to get pregnant. Yeah, I was just alluding to the fact that the complications afterwards Right, right. Of affecting exactly. the ovary and whatever else surrounding the tissues there. That's what right. Because of the inflammation and, and all the 
costs and everything that can go on. It can be somebody, I, I sometimes I describe it to patients as think of somebody pouring crazy glue into your tummy and, and you, right. you, know, you, get, you know, the, the adhesions really do. Exactly. So they look like somebody poured crazy glue and, and people sometimes get a, what is called a frozen pelvis from that. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was why I was trying to allude to in terms of uh, scarring that takes place there. Correct. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, I have learned so much tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. you know, what is amazing is the, the delivery, what you gave us in a nutshell and in the Q&A um, is invaluable. And the way that it was presented for us to understand <coughs> Um, we appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And this is a very, very important subject. There are so many young ones today that have problems of infertility. Freeze your eggs, freeze your sperm, do it early. I think it's one of my take home messages. Watch things you put in your body, those phthalates. And you know, supplement excessive work. alcohol. Ah. That's a whole different topic, right there, right? Not good. There's no vitamin in alcohol. <laughs> there isn't. Thank you for bringing that up. There isn't, and that is the truth. So um, we really need to have lifestyle changes, you know, uh, because what we put in our body impacts every organ every area so i'm going to yield back to you dr famuiwa thank you so much it's been a pleasant night and um i i really do like um you guys are such a nice audience <laughs> it's a very sympathetic audience it's hard easy to shine um thank you so much i i look forward to um our next talk i love it i learn myself from different forums that uh, you've had and I, I tell my patients to listen in and even my staff. I know my office manager is one of um, your regulars, actually. So, but thank you so much. I, I really am very honored and humbled that you allow me to come speak. Thank you. Thank you. So and are you much. coming back? Oh, so that will be between Dr. O and I. <laughs> See, you have to, I, 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 um, I have a difficulty just talking without showing what I'm talking about. So that means I have to prepare slides. And that's the part that sometimes takes me a little while to, to get what I, but it's getting easier because my topic really just talks about the same thing. Maybe I might expound on a different aspect at another time, but I'm really still talking about the same thing. I, I find the science the biology of reproduction to me is fascinating. So you don't want to get me started. I might bore you to tears. <laughs> <laughs> no, your, your area of medicine is not boring at all. And, you know, it's very uh, understandable why you need slides for your specialty, because it's a visual thing. If we don't see, then it doesn't really hit home. Yeah. You know, when you show those slides, it helps us see, okay, this is what I'm looking at. This is where it is. So we thank you for the time you put in. Um, we, and we thank you because you, you do try to make it once a month, even though sometimes we, we stretch it a little bit. So we, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank and um, I want to also note that, you know, we don't establish patient uh, of physician-patient interaction on this forum. Um, we, we give information, advice, and um, if you want to consult with uh, Dr. Famuiwa, please uh, get in touch with me by email, or Dr. Famuiwa, if you can post your information oh, absolutely. on there, please. Um, get in touch whichever way, if you have my cell phone number, get in touch with me, I'll always respond. Uh, by email, I will respond. By text message, I will. And uh, you can contact her. 
She is one of our best. I, I know people personally who have successfully have multiples in our practice, you know, and uh, um, she's a gift to us. Thank you. If you go to my website, there's a little box. You type in a message there. We will get back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. O. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody. So guess what? Next week. You remember the health matters? Remember we the health matters where we have the program where people come together to learn lifestyle change, how to change their lives for better living by what we put in our mouth and exercises and all of that. We did that first one and that led to the second one. That second one concluded yesterday. It was so much fun. Oh my gosh. I learned a whole load of new things. You know, I keep saying it. Now I'm struggling to put on weight and weight loss is a side effect of, you know, <coughs> changing the lifestyle. Isn't that amazing? So our team on Health Matters 2 are going to come on next week to come share with us their experience. And oh my, you are in for a treat. This group is amazing. Just like the first one, this one too is so amazing. I am the one that is getting the best of all worlds. So, but I don't want to keep it to myself. Be back next week mm -hmm. so that you can share with us live on Medical Mondays with Dr. O. So till we see that. <laughs> thank you, Dr. O. Papu, you are Dr. O. Everybody, thank you. Thank you so much. So keep safe, please. Thank you. Everywhere you are, COVID is still raging in some areas. Thank you and have a blessed night.